been spending too much time <laughs> over the last four months trying to formalize um, the DDC core language in Coq, as people may be aware. Uh, and so I've, I'm starting with really, because I'm a Coq new to start with. So I've been working up complexities of languages. Um, so what's the time, by the way? I won't Quarter take too long. Oh, there's one over there. So I should probably stop about seven, five past seven or so. All right, so um, working up languages, kind of building as I go, because like DDC core has uh, system F polymorphism, algebraic data types, um, mutability, like a store, um, mutability polymorphism, all this stuff. So I'm, that's too hard. <laughs> I'll start from simply typed lambda calculus, which I've done. I've done PCF, which is simply typed with um, fixed points and booleans and anything else. I've done simply typed with mutable references. So it's a, a monomorphic language, but you have ML style refs, which you can write stuff into. And I've done simply typed with algebraic data, which is sort of what this comes from, which is the hardest one I've done before. I've also done system F and system F2. So system F has type polymorphism, and system F2 has type application. So you have general kinds, like starter, 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 whatever. Um, so I've made it there. So I have quite the, the basic features, like data types and mutability in, in simply typed, and I have F and F2, and now that's done, I'm going to start combining and then working the way up to the DDC core, which is the top. So this, uh, I've sort of been keeping track of my time as I do this as well. So like simply typed, to learn Coq and sim do simply typed um, with Benjamin Pierce's software financial course, took about two weeks of evenings. It was, it was easy. To do the other versions were like a day or two um, extra, so not really too much of a problem, um, the simply typed ones. System F was like maybe three days work, and then algebraic data was about two weeks <laughs> because of this problem, so I'll talk about this problem. Um, but I've worked it out, but I sort of, when I was doing the proof, I got to a point and said, so I have to prove this, and then make a lemma and prove that, well, what do I need now? Oh, I need to prove that, make a lemma. When I had done it, I had said, it said proof accepted. Then I'm thinking, oh, what have I done? I don't understand what I've done. <laughs> How does this work? <laughs> like the proof works, but I don't understand what happened. So I'm giving this talk to explain it to myself. <laughs> so so take, it, take it slightly. So here's a basic uh, uh, functional language with algebraic types. We have variables, lambdas, applications, data, cons, like uh, cons and, and nil. So it's got a, a constructor name, some more arguments, um, and then we have case expressions with a, an expression and a list of alternatives. So very simple language. Uh, and the, the tricky part is, is formalizing uh, small step evaluation and then big step evaluation and then showing the link between the two. Now, the thing is about evaluation context, so I'll just quickly say what evaluation context is if you haven't seen it. So these are... Um, Evaluation rules. Some people have seen this all before, but I'll just go through it. It says that if you have some expression applied to some other expression, well, how do you evaluate this? First, you have to evaluate the function. So if, it, if, if the function part can step, then you can evaluate the whole thing. So the, the function part steps, and you keep reducing that till the function part becomes a value. So you've got a real function. And then you keep reducing the argument until that's a value. And you've got this one. Then you substitute the value into the body and then continue on. So um, you've got these, these kind of like a boilerplate rules. It says uh, like this, this one's being forced to a value because of its use as a function. And this one's being forced to a value because it's an argument. So it's like these two rules are like boilerplate. I'm trying to write these in a nicer way which is what evaluation contexts are for. Um, you can see it's more of a problem when you have data, data constructors. So just pretend D is something like cons or nil or tuple two or something. Uh, I want to enforce left to right order of evaluation because I'm going to use this in a language with effects. So it has to have a sensible order. So it says, take the first argument and you can keep reducing it and you want this to be a value. And then once this is a value, 
you can use the next rule. When the first one's the first argument's a value, then you can reduce the second argument. And when that's a value, you can then reduce the next one. So the fact that the rules are set up like this uh, ensure that things are evaluated left to right. Very important. These rules are classified all Yes. So this is like just examples. That's right. So n can be anything, right? Or 0 or 100 or whatever. Like if it's, if it's a tuple 3, then it's 3. If it's cons, it's 2. If it's nil, it's none. So, but <laughs> something I've worked out, if you see uh, a language description and they're using dot, 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 you know it's going to be a bitch to formalize because it's like they, they could say, oh, this is sort of what I'm doing. It's like, go and work it out yourself how to do this, right? So dot, 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 <laughs> stay away from it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, I don't have partial application of data constructors. That explains yep. So yeah, so it would work if you allowed partial application, application data constructors, but I'm not doing that. But I am allowing uh, general expressions as arguments. So some formalizations would say the only thing which can be applied to a data constructor is a value or a, a, a variable, but I, I don't want to do that. Okay, so evaluation context. Basically, formalize the notion of what stuff has to be evaluated first. So if you have something applied to an argument, the thing at the front can go. If you have a value, like a real function applied to an argument, the thing, the argument can, can go. If you have a case of something, you have to reduce the discriminant to a value first before you can do anything. And then you have a family of contexts for data constructor data constructors. So you have to, you have to do the, the, first, the first one. And then when the first argument's a value, you can do the second one. When these two are values, you can do the third one, and, then, and so on. So the fact that we have a family of uh, context here is, is tricky. Um, so just a bit more how these contexts work. Say if I define a context, I'm going to say C1 is the context which has a whole in this part of the case expression. When I apply the context to an expression, I just fill in the hole. Okay? That's just the notation that I'm using. Happy with that? Um, and then once I've defined these contexts, C is some arbitrary context. So you say for, for any context, if there's some expression in the context and, and that expression can go, it can evaluate, then you can change the next expression in the same context. So um, if I have something in a case, if this is a discriminant of a case expression and then the, the discriminant can go, then you can evaluate, take a step with the case expression. Um, so it's basically this rule and the definition of these contexts um, uh, collapses all these rules and these rules into this one, the one rule, this one. Good so far. So evaluation context. These are the things I'm, I'm talking about. And this is how you actually formalize it in COC. How you actually write down what an evaluation context are is you define them all. And in COC, this in inductive CPTX, so expression context is like, this is like a data type sort of. Um, just imagine this is a data type. And I say, for instance, say, an uh, app2 context is one where uh, the, the function part is already a value, and then the argument part is a whole. And I define the context as a, a function which allows me to fill the whole. So it's a lambda expression. I can just take this function and apply it to an argument and then fill the whole. So contexts are things with holes. I, here's, here's something which lets me fill the whole.
Red Scream. Um, what is it? Is this? Currently dealing with technical issues. Hello? Hello? Hello, here we go. All right, so we defined the language. Yep. So in, in, in your definition of context, fill the holes or the top level? The, the, the hole uh, can be at the top level, so that the outermost expression can be reduced and then. Uh, if something's applied as a function, then it can be reduced. If it's an argument, and then... Is that what you meant? So you, so you don't have a notion of a big expression with a hole somewhere down in the world? No. So that, that would be an arbitrary context. You could use that sort of context for formalizing where you can apply optimizations or rewrites. So an evaluation context, the holes are only places where you do reduction in terms of small step semantics. So small step. Um, so you've got some other strategy to work out what you're going to reduce. No, this, this tells you what you want to reduce. So when, when you have a whole expression and you're going to step it, the only place you can step are the places defined by these contexts. So you only start, you start like at, at, the, at the, the outermost. You don't do reductions inside the term. Okay. Um, in, in this sort of thing. I mean, it's true that lambda calculus, you can reduce under lambdas because the thing's confluent. But when you form, I'm trying to formalize a, what the, comp the actual thing does at runtime, and it reduces in this way. It doesn't reduce under lambdas because you're basically rewriting functions. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. So yeah, these are only evaluation. You could use different sorts of context for different things. So then you want to prove things about the language. So I've talked about this before, an important thing is progress, which says that if you have a, if some expression is, is well typed, then either the expression is already done, it's, it's already a value, or it, it can take a step. Yep. Um, so, um, are you assuming that next to make time or the steps to run? So, you, you got a step that's a different thing? Yeah, so, so step requires these to be different. Okay. So, this step predicate requires these to be different. Um, uh, yeah. So you, yeah. So either either it's done and it's already a value, or it can step. So that's what I'm trying to prove for this language. So for the for the basic things like function application, in case it's easy, for to prove this for an arbitrary data constructor application is is difficult. Well, it's difficult error because if you have, um, say, it's got five arguments, you want to prove that. Either they're all done, or one of them can take this, take a step. But which one? Pardon? It might already be a value. That's right. <laughs> the first one, which isn't a value. So you have to find it in the in this proof. Okay. And then remember, we're doing we're doing proof by induction. I mean, all proof is by induction, right? <laughs> so inductively. So the induction hypothesis is. For every one of these expressions, either the expression is a value or it can take a step. Okay, that's the induction. That's, that's the induction hypothesis. We get all of these. To handle a uh, constructor applied to many things, you can't do induction over the number of expressions applied to this, because this data constructor requires a fixed number of expressions. If I have like a, a tuple constructor, tuple four, there needs to be four things. If it's cons, it needs to be two things. I can't do induction over the length of this list. It, does, it doesn't work. Because if I did that, if I chopped, like, if this needs five, and I chopped that one off, that's no longer well typed, and it can't step. Okay. So the induction principle is induction over the number of expressions which are already values. Okay. So that's, that's part of the, tr the tricky thing about writing down. So you can imagine, uh, sup yeah, so. You need to do induction over, over the number of things which are already values. Okay. Can you get around that by uh, only allowing constructors to take or to have recurrence for some reason? So you could have, you basically could you know, parse these twice. 
Yeah, I mean, I mean, as as I say, I mean, if, if you only allowed constructors to be applied to variables, they'd all, there'd be no evaluation to do. So you, you can, it is possible to change the language to make the proof easier. But if you're going to say this is my language, I'm going to prove that. You have to do this. So yeah, I mean, it's kind of a, a balance between making the language simpler to make the proof easier, and then taking it so the programs are easier to write, and then doing a harder proof. So. You imagine that all the expressions need to be evaluated. Um, so you, you, do, you reduce the first one to a value, the second one to a value, third one to a value, fourth one to a value, in that order. Uh, you need to invent all these contexts in different uh, steps along the way. Well, for this theorem, to show that one of these can step, it could be any one of these contexts. Okay. So, but that's not the hard part. <laughs> okay, so. Uh, so again, uh, so one of the things you have to prove for this is that, given that progress is true for each of these sub-expressions, there exists a well. So start again. Given that progress is true for each sub-expression, either all sub-expressions are already values, or there exists a context where one of them can take a step. Okay, which is what this lemma says, which I worked out. So it says. Um, so one of them can take a step. I've just contracted into P. So imagine P says exists X prime such that X goes to X prime. Uh, so in, in Coq, um, for all is a keyword with lowercase. It says for all predicates, for all lists. This capital F for all, which I've written in blue, means this is true of all list elements. So it's a constructed thing. but just for all applies to lists, and little for all applies to anything. So anyway, that's what this, this lemma says. Um, if all a list of expressions are either values or have some property, then either they're all values or there is a context such that uh, one of them have the, has the property. So you need that for progress. Okay. So that I sort of worked out. So that, that wasn't too bad. Now this, this really killed me. Um, this is a, a lemma that you need to prove uh, correspondence between this, the big step and the small step evaluation. So uh, big step sort of formalizes the evaluation in a different sort of way, but it's still equivalent to small step. And you want to show that these two ways of formalizing the evaluation are equivalent. So you want to be able to take a small step, or a, you want to take a, a, from small to big step, you want to do a proof that given a, a trace of evaluation in small step semantics, you can convert that to a trace in big step semantics, which shows that these are the, the same. And then given a trace in big step, you can convert that to a small step. The fact that you can do a round loop for all expressions means that these are equivalent, even though they might be written in a slightly different way. Okay, so this lemma is needed when converting big step to small step. It says that, um, so by the way, this steps means it can take multiple steps. Before I was using um, step, which is a single step. Steps could be zero or, or many steps. So this says that, if I have a list of expressions, xs, and all of these expressions can reduce the values. And the values that they reduce to are really values. Then if I have a constructor applied to these expressions, then I can reduce that to a constructor applied to the values. Seems fairly straightforward. Or well, it seems straightforward. So yeah, so it's basically uh, making it's sort of making the, the list of expressions the evaluation context now. So now I'm reducing all of these excesses to vs's. And if you know about big step semantics, you can see this is sort of a, a big step flavor because we have a whole bunch of things which need to be evaluated, and in the, the result, it's all done. So this is a this itself is a value as well. So it's it's all done. So I have all this stuff which needs to be done. And then in the result, it's, it's all done. It's not just do one little bit, do one little bit. It's like 
done. <laughs> okay, so, uh, so here's where I have to convince myself I know what I'm talking about. <laughs> so to do this evaluation, we still have to come up with contexts because you, you can only reduce each one of these, each one of the expressions in this list, when all the things that are left are already values. So you sort of want to show uh, that there exists a, a, a chain of contexts. So what I want to do is, well, oh, sorry, the way I build up this proof that I can reduce, sorry, I can reduce uh, all of these excesses to values is just doing them one at a time. I say, well, if, for instance, the first one's a value, if, if, I, if I can show that the, an application of the first one being a value and the rest expressions, I can steps that to all values, and I can steps x3 to uh, a value, then, so is that right? Have I messed it up? It should, yeah, that should be v2, x, x, x2 to v2. Then I can get that much. And that's, that's wrong as well, so that should be x. <laughs> See, I've shifted all these numbers by one. Sorry, <laughs> that's really confusing. So if, if, I, if, I, if I have uh, this reduces to all values, and then I can show that x3 reduces to v3, then I can show that that reduces to all values. So I build up each of these evaluations once, one bit at a time. That's what I'm going for. And then in, in the proof, um, you actually want to take, um, in, in the actual the proof, you actually want to take a statement of this form and invert it. So you're saying, given a statement that I have a data constructor of, of this form steps to that, I want to be able to invert this and find out what, well, first of all, what thing reduced and also what context it reduced in. Okay, so this is like the, the forwards part. But to prove the other way, I want to take this statement and find out what the evaluation context is. But that, that information isn't in this statement. Because, I mean, in this one... Pardon? It is. Yeah, so the f which, which evaluation context when isn't in this statement. Because, I mean, if you look at this directly, it looks like this one stepped. But suppose v4 was already a value in the original, and then, and then that one went. So just from this statement, you don't know. OK, so anyway, when you're trying to do this, you're trying to prove something similar to, similar to before, finding a context. There exists a context where, where one of them can go. Um, so I'm going to try and prove this. And I, I tried to prove a lemma of this form. So it says, given all the expressions can go to values, then there is a context where uh, the context holds the thing that I'm going to reduce. So I've found the expression which is going to reduce, and then I've found the value that it, it goes to, and then x really goes to v. So I've found the context. So it would, it would, this, this is what I wanted. Um, but it doesn't work because of what this, this c means. Uh, this, this C is a, a list of expressions with a hole. So when I fill a hole with it, so suppose C was this context, values, then expressions, and here's the hole. When I fill the hole with X, I put an X here. When I fill a hole with a V, I put a V here. But in this version, it's not the same as all values because the ones later on on the right-hand side aren't all values in the previous one. So can you see that? So it's like, uh, this is what I want. Hope, I hope you saw that. <laughs> so if I take one of these and plug in x here and plug in v here, it's not the same as this with, with v there because the stuff on the, the right is different. Um, so I actually need to represent both of these contexts. Um, a context where the thing which you can evaluate is here and the rest are expressions and a context where the thing to evaluate is here and the rest are something else. So this is joint evaluation context. These are related, but they're not the same. Pardon? What do you mean the second one for? Because um, the way the proof works. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Uh, 
I could step through the cock proof and show it to you, but it's all I can offer at the moment. <laughs> Yeah, um, I guess part of the problem is that um, given a C, you still can't find out what it is because C is a function. So given a C, like a, a, in cock, even though I could only construct these functions in a certain way, akin to my rules, if I have a C object, I can't break it up and look inside because it's a function and you can't invert functions. So that's sort of part of the problem. So, yep. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> that sounds even more complicated. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, I mean, I, I, I had done most of this proof, and I got to a point where I needed to show that c x equals c v, and I was going. I had I had a statement c x equals c v. That was the last goal in my proof. Like some function applied to x is the same as some function applied to v. I'm going. <laughs> It doesn't work, right? Because you can't invert functions. You can't look inside a function and see what it is. Um, and then getting to the next part took another two weeks, <laughs> just fixing that one goal. So what you actually have to do is just represent these two contexts explicitly. You have um, yeah, the same as before. Given all these things can reduce the values, then there is a joint context where um, exactly these two, where um, X can go to V, and then the fact that you represent them explicitly makes it, makes it work. So it's just what I said, except that um, this lemma actually has the two contexts. And I won't give you the proof of that, but just realizing that this was my problem was the hard part. So and then here is the definition of those joint contexts, which I might just show you. Same sort of thing as before. Um, you can only reduce some, something later in the list when the first thing is a value, but both contexts require the first thing to be the same value. But then the rest of the elements can be different because C1 and C2 can be different. Okay, that's it. Any questions or should I just? Yeah, I know. <laughs> I, I agree. So. Pardon? Yeah, yeah. So I, uh, as I say, I, I kind of just powered through, and I got to this.